There are plenty of good seats up front. No surprise there. And we're going to get started. So welcome. Are we good online? Hi, online people uh, and people watching on video. Good to have you with us. Good to have all of you here in the room on a, another lovely Sunday morning. Uh, and we are, we're back for Who Do You Say I Am Encountering the Newer Testament. And uh, today's going to be fun. We're talking about several topics. We're talking about Jesus, of course, uh, but the Gospels and Judaism. So mostly I want to spend the first half of our time uh, kind of as an introduction to the Gospels, and then also the second half of our time talking about uh, Judaism, the importance of understanding Jesus as a Jew, as a particularly a first century Jew living in Galilee. So it's going to feel a little bit like we're doing, um, you know, background or just, you, know, you might be thinking like, when are we going to get to the actual biblical texts? One of the joys about doing the Newer Testament compared to the Older Testament so we can go a little bit slower. We can take our time. We can stop occasionally and come up for air and talk about some big issues. And so Margaret and I have got that built into the schedule. Uh, you know, I mean, we don't have to just run through book after book after book. The pace can be a little slower. So if you were part of last year, this year, you know, everybody just relax a bit. And it's going to be uh, it's a little more manageable, I think, pace-wise. And so we wanted to set the table for talking about uh, the Gospels before we actually start digging into the Gospels next week when we'll do the Gospel according to Mark. So that's the plan. If you're wondering, you know, what are the goals of all of this? Sorry, my slide's not advancing for some. There we go. Uh, what is the goal for today in particular? Uh, it's this. It's not background. We're not going to do history for the sake of history. There's some great seats up front here for folks just coming in. Uh, you can come in the side doors, whatever. Uh, it's to this. It's to prepare us to explore how each gospel presents us with a particular view or a distinctive view of Jesus, and also a particular view of what the good news is, what he teaches and what he enacts. In other words, we want to prepare you now for looking at the four gospels and asking the question, what's distinctive about this? How does this present Jesus uh, and his message in a, in a particular way, in a way that's not just like all of the other ones. So we get a sense for some of the diversity that we find in the Newer Testament. So uh, that's what I'm doing. That's why we're going about this. If it feels a little bit too historical at times, trust me, this is all coming back to this notion of how do we encounter Jesus in the Newer Testament. I want to say, too, we also have a, a scholar video online, an interview that Margaret and I did uh, with a Canadian scholar named Matt Thiessen, and uh, it's talking about Jesus and Judaism. It's on the church's website. If you don't know how to access that, grab Margaret or myself later on. We'll be happy to show you, but that's kind of a supplement to today. I want to start by giving you a question to consider, and it's this. It's what kind of gospel passages do you find especially meaningful uh, and why? And by gospel passages, I don't mean like particular chapter verse or a particular story, although you might have one. But I'm more interested in thinking in general here. And so here are some gospel stories. Again, you might not have read the gospels, but maybe, uh, maybe you've heard them uh, from time to time in a place like this, which is a church. Uh, stories about healings, uh, the parables that Jesus tells, things like the story about the Good Samaritan. Uh, teachings, Sermon on the Mount, for example, or other opportunities where he tells us what he thinks. Uh, maybe you love stories about legal interpretation when he's involved in a controversy with other religious teachers about things like the Sabbath or about dietary laws. Maybe you uh, appreciate one-on-one -on -one encounters. There's a Samaritan woman sitting by a well that Jesus meets in John chapter 4. Uh, the story of Zacchaeus, who's the, the chief tax collector who climbs a tree and Jesus goes to his home. Maybe you like stories like that where Jesus is with one person and there's dialogue. Uh, passion stories. Passion here, not in the sense of, you know, romance novels, but in the sense of uh, the passion is the kind of the, the term to describe everything from the arrest of Jesus up until his crucifixion and burial. Um, maybe those kinds of stories. Uh, resurrection stories. I think you know what those are. Uh, or maybe others. I haven't listed all of them, but these are various kinds of stories that we encounter in all four Gospels. And so I'm curious, what kind might you find especially meaningful to you uh, and why. And for this, just pair up with a person. Your whole table will get too loud and chaotic. But I just would ask you to pair up uh, with someone next to you and just briefly answer this. I'll give you like 90 seconds to do it. And folks online, feel free to use the chat feature and 
write down what you think. All right, we're halfway there. So if your partner hasn't spoken yet, it's time to share the floor. All right, now there's a twist. Stay with your partner. There's a second question, which is this. What kind of gospel passages prompt the most questions or confusion from you, and why? Might be the same as the first, might be something totally different, but here's your next question. What kind of stories prompt the most confusion or questions from you? So, and if there are, there's five, six lovely chairs here in the front if people wanna come up, and I'm quite safe. Again, 90 seconds, you can use the chat online. Halfway through this one. All right, I'll call us back. Just to get a little bit of feedback first by show of hands, who found the first question easiest to answer, the one about most meaningful? About a quarter of you. Who found the second one easier to answer in terms of, and some of you just, they were equally easy or hard for you. All right, you're very, you're very consistent in that regard. Um, so I'm curious, uh, anybody want to share their, their perspective on this? Uh, we got Tim over there with a microphone and... Um, He's really good at maneuvering his way through chairs and things. It's not or maybe somebody shared something. Maybe you found a point of agreement with, your, with the person you were speaking with that you struck you as interesting. Can you make it up front? <laughs> try not to bounce. We need a boom into, mic try, is what we try need. Try not to bounce into people. anybody on the way. All right. Well, Ronnie and I uh, kind of agreed on, on things. Parables um, were the most, sort of the most interesting and intriguing, but also we had the most questions about them, and we decided that a lot of times Jesus is proposing a sort of a riddle uh, 
uh, to really make his um, followers think. And the durability of par parables might be, at least for me, is that you, in, you can interpret them in different ways and maybe at different times you see different things in the parables. Yeah. Great, thank you. I'm looking forward to talking about parables in the weeks ahead too. Um. We in, observe that often the, the disciples had questions. They would, Jesus would do something, and later on they'd call him aside and say, just what is going on here? And, yeah. Right. Yeah, it, it mirrors the, the story in some way, right? Some of the people sometimes find great comfort in what Jesus is talking about, other times not so much. Uh, in our uh, small group, we uh, thought that the one-on-one uh, -on -one encounters were the ones that were the most uh, uh, meaningful to us, particularly oftentimes the one-on-one uh, -on -one encounters uh, after the resurrection, hmm. um, particularly where the disciples don't recognize Jesus. Yeah. yeah. Margaret's got some folks online, and then I think I'll move on after this. But. Um, yeah, just hearing from folks online, they've listed parables and resurrection stories and casting out demons. I'm not sure whether those were in answer to the most comforting or most confusing, um, which I think sure. is actually an interesting question. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah but they're, they're engaged as well. So. Awesome. Good. Um, we could keep talking about this, and these are all stories, kinds of stories we're going to come back to. Um, there's a way in which I don't think this is necessarily how the Gospels were written, but the way the Gospels have been used in churches and in preaching and in things like that, where we kind of feel ourselves called in to participate in the story sometimes with those one-on-one -on -one, um, passages in particular. Uh, also with the parables, because Jesus doesn't <clears throat> tie them all up and give an answer key or something like that. We sometimes are drawn into conversation. Right? There's a way in which we've been socialized around these books to imagine ourselves in them, right? Or to imagine ourselves meeting Jesus. And that's, I think, again, Something about how the way the books were written, but also more so about how they've been used. So I want to dig in a little bit more to these books, these four books that start off the Newer Testament, the Gospels. And I want to just cover five basic points. And so I'll do these in turn. And the first is just to note that they're all anonymous. That we call them the Gospel according to Matthew and to Mark and to Luke and to John. None of the Gospels carry the name of an author. None of them say, you know, I'm Luke, I'm writing this. Those names get attached to these books, as best we can tell, around the year 150 to 170, somewhere in there. At least that's when we see other, uh, other works referring to these books uh, and talking about their, uh, the names of authors and traditions around who those authors were. Uh, and so Matthew traditionally has been understood to be written by one of the disciples of Jesus, same with John. Uh, Mark and Luke not names of disciples, but have been typically seen as kind of associates of, of certain disciples. But the books themselves really leave us with no um, kind of clear footing about who wrote them, where they were written, and exactly when they might have been written. We have to try to piece that together on our own. But the Gospels never just come around and make a claim and say things like, um, uh, you know, that kind of let us know what kind of information, with one exception in a minute, uh, what kind of information the author might or might not have. It's also the case for these books, I think as best we can tell, the authors are not necessarily authors the way we often think of authors. Right? An author today is somebody who uh, has done the creative work or has done all of the research uh, and who kind of owns that intellectual property, right? It's their book. You can't copy it. It seems with these Gospels more likely that the people who actually put them to paper for the very first time were people who were already inheriting stories that had been passed along, right? that had been told, they're, these are memories, uh, and so they're not so much authors who are making up something brand new, although there might be some aspects of that in each Gospel. But we might think of them more as kind of collators or collectors or editors as much as they are authors. That's kind of important for us, you know, us, us moderns to think about because we often worry so much about, you know, who's responsible for these words, right? Uh, for better or for worse, right? Who gets the royalties or who can I blame or who's breached a contract? Those types of things uh, are kind of important in modern society when it comes to texts. Uh, but it appears in the ancient world there was not so much of a problem to add on to somebody's writings, to make changes, to expand, to contract. So I want to hold on to that as, as something to remember about the Gospels. And once again, my 
computer's frozen. What they say about themselves. Okay, there are places where we see in the Gospels, we can detect in Gospels places where they um, kind of describe what the book is supposed to do. Maybe the best example of this is at the end of John's Gospel. They're very close to the end of John's Gospel where the author breaks in or the narrator breaks in and says this, now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples that are not written in this book. In other words, more happened, right? These are relatively short books. And we who like biographies, right? We're used to like 500, 700, 900. We, we want to know everything, right? We want to know where somebody went to school, what their parents were like. We want to know what kind of food they ate, etc. cetera. Uh, the gospels are very slim on details. Then the author says, but these are written so that, me, so that you may continue to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. In other words, the author is saying, I've written this for a pastoral purpose, right? I've written this to build faith. I haven't written this just to pass along every single story that might have been passed along, right? I've been choosy because I'm trying to make sure that people understand they have life in the name of Jesus and that people continue to believe. In other words, the book itself confesses that it's insider literature, right? This is not saying, you know, make copies of this book, put it on somebody's doorbell, ring the bell and run away, and then they'll become Christians, right? It's not that kind of book, right? This is literature that's meant, written to people who probably already know the story, and it's trying to interpret the story as they go along. Something similar happens at the beginning of Luke's gospel. Here's a place where the author tells us something about his credentials. The beginning of Luke says this, since many have undertaken to compile a narrative about the events that have been fulfilled among us. In other words, the author of Luke is saying, other people have already written this story down. So that's interesting, right? Luke doesn't understand whoever this person is, does not understand himself as being the very first person to write a gospel. Uh, Just as they were handed on to us by those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and servants of the word, here the author seems to be saying, that he was not one of these eyewitnesses. In other words, he's not part of the first generation of followers of Jesus. I too decided, as one having a grasp of everything from the start, suggesting he's done some research, he's done some thinking, some reflection, perhaps you know, met with people, to write a well-ordered account for you, most excellent Theophilus. This is the addressee of Luke's gospel, maybe the person uh, who commissioned the work, uh, it could also just mean like, dear gentle reader, you know, it, it, it might be a real person or it might just be you. Uh, Theophilus means the one whom God loves or the one who God loves. So it could just be a kind of all y'all. Um, why did this person write this? So that you may have a firm grasp of the words in which you have been instructed. In other words, you already know the basics, right? I'm giving you this gospel so that it might buttress your faith, so it might help your faith. Right? Again, insider literature, right? meant to help with um, instruction in faith, right? meant to help with helping people get a firmer grounding in their faith. So the author confesses, I'm not telling everything, right? I'm not writing history for the sake of doing history. I'm not a neutral observer in the events I'm going to tell you about. Right? I'm writing to build your faith. The Gospels then are written for pastoral purposes. Right? They're meant to build up communities and to help Christian readers get a deeper understanding of what they've already been taught. Which doesn't mean that an outsider can't make any sense of it, it just means these are not gospels, these are not books that are necessarily written to convert outsiders as much as to build up the inside. That makes sense? Good. All right. Uh, the basic idea of a gospel, what in the world do we mean when we say that? This is a very churchy word. You don't hear the word gospel in a lot of other contexts. When you do, it's sometimes, you know, sarcastic. Uh, so what do we mean when we talk about a gospel? Well, in the books themselves, the gospels, capital G, uh, the gospel according to, uh, we see Jesus often use this word, and it appears it was probably a word that he himself used, or at least a, you know, an equivalent of it. Um, And so one example of this is at the beginning of Mark's gospel, very early on in the story. Now, after John was arrested, after John the Baptist was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee proclaiming the good news of God and saying the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. Where you see good news there, that's the same as gospel. So that English word gospel apparently is from Middle English, Old English. It's an Old English word small o, capital E. Uh, It's an old word that just simply means good news, right? I believe it was good spell is where it originally came from. Uh, And in Greek as well, that's what the term means. It literally means a good announcement, a pleasant announcement, a favorable announcement. 
So it's not a term that Jesus invents or that the church invents. It's already a word that's out there in circulation in the wider world. What did it mean? Well, it depends who you're looking at, who you're looking to. Uh, in the broader Greco-Roman world, remember the Roman Empire rules pretty much everything around the Mediterranean in the first century. And they're still speaking Greek in most places of the Roman Empire. But that term that we translate as good news could be what happens when an announcement comes to your city to announce maybe a tax amnesty, uh, or maybe the report you know, that the barbarians out in the, in the hinterlands have been repelled by the Roman army, and this is good news. Uh, maybe there's been a bumper crop this year, and the grain giveaways are going to be even better than they were last year. That would be good news. Somebody has come to announce gospel where you live. And we see a lot of this in Roman propaganda as well where they might talk about the ways in which the emperor has just done nothing but bring good news to all of us. In, you know, in election season, we're used to that kind of language, right? So it's out there in the broader world of just some kind of declaration that life's good, things are going to get better. But it, we also see it in a variety of other places. Actually, I'm going to come back to this slide. In the Older Testament, a variety of authors use the term as well, or at least the equivalent of the term. Uh, we see it in places like um, the books of Samuel and Kings, uh, when um, it's what couriers would say after there's been some kind of a military victory. They would come and bring a gospel. I talked about that. Uh, but Isaiah, the second part of Isaiah, or the latter chapters of Isaiah, uh, occasionally use the word as well. In contexts like this, how beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of the messenger who announces peace, who brings good news, who announces salvation, who says to Zion, your God reigns. So Isaiah here is thinking about a future coming of salvation. He's talking about the joys of one who announces something new, right? This is written in the context of people coming back from exile. So Isaiah is like, isn't it great when somebody shows up and says, peace, when somebody says, you can go home, right? When somebody says, you're no longer a captive. So that's the root of of it. There was no ancient like literary genre called gospels, right? If you went to a Barnes and Noble in the first century, there's not going to be a, a shelf labeled that. But it starts to become then known as a genre because Christian authors start writing these books about Jesus, which takes me back then to Mark 1, verse 1. Uh, Mark's not a great, uh, let's just say Mark's a little choppy when it comes to literary aesthetics, right? And so instead of starting with, it was a dark and stormy night, or it was the best of times, it was the worst of times, this is the opening line in Mark's gospel, the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, uh, which might seem like, start reading here, you know, it might, be, it might feel like that to you, uh, but rather it might be a little bit more profound. Perhaps what Mark is saying is, this whole story I'm going to tell you from the beginning of Jesus's ministry up until his resurrection is yet only the beginning of the good news. What does it mean? Well, I don't know. It depends on how you read Mark. It could mean either one of those, right? Um, but it's interesting that Mark uses this expression right out of the gate, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Later on, other authors, other Christians in the second century start referring to these four books as gospels. One author calls them memoirs, which is interesting as well. You can see the church doesn't necessarily have a name for these books just yet. But over time, tradition, they become known as gospels. So that's what holds them together. The four Gospels we have in the Newer Testament, uh, we're going to keep coming back to this week after week about their distinctiveness. At the same time, they do share some connections in terms of their plot. In other words, they all tell the same basic story. And of course, the variations are what's interesting, at least to somebody like me. I'm more interested in what makes them different than what makes them similar. So I'm making sure here at the outset, I'm saying, the four Gospels follow a basic plot structure uh, if you were to map that out, right, if you're doing a book report in fourth grade and you're, what's the plot, this is what you would say for all four Gospels. Um, at least this is what unites them, right? All of them talk about Jesus having a connection to John the Baptist or John the Baptizer uh, and his teachings. In other words, Jesus is not this lone voice who just shows up and nobody's talking like he's talking or nobody it seems to be kind of one of his people. Uh, Jesus has other teachers, there are other voices in his time and place that are important for him. Uh, he performs wondrous deeds uh, and teaches about the reign of God, sometimes translated the kingdom of God. We'll come back and talk about that when, Margaret, November or something? Uh, yes, I think November 3rd. We know, November 3rd. 
somewhere around there. Early November. What else are you going to be thinking about in November but politics? So we'll come back to uh, Reign of God, uh, which attracts followers. It makes him really popular, but it also sparks sustained debate with certain Jewish leaders. He's controversial, in other words. All the Gospels confess that. He's popular. He's doing things people haven't seen before. People are amazed by him. And he's also provoking some folks along the way. Uh, all the Gospels talk about Jesus being arrested in Jerusalem near Passover. The specific timing's a little bit different, but by and large, that's how they all remember it. They all talk about Jesus being summarily interrogated and hastily executed by Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor. And Pilate also has some support from the leading members of the priestly arist aristocracy in Jerusalem. Chief priests, high priests, these are the really, the muckety-mucks, we would say, in Jerusalem. And then all four Gospels speak of Jesus' as followers finding his tomb empty and then encountering him, or at least there being a promise to encounter him in Mark's Gospel, uh, in a resurrected body. Something about him is both familiar and the same. Something about him is now different and changed. That's the basic skeleton, really, of all four Gospels. What becomes interesting, then, is how each Gospel author fills it in in a variety of ways. And we'll come back to that um, over and over. One question that people might have is, what does this mean about history? Like, what can we really know? What really happened? What do we know for sure? Well, you need a historian for that. And uh, here I am. So <laughs> it depends, right? At the end of the day, can we prove without a doubt that Jesus did or said anything the Gospels say? No. Can we disprove without a doubt that he didn't say any of these things? Or can, we, you know, can we prove the opposite? Can we disprove everything in there? No. Right? There's limits to what history can establish, what historical methods can establish when you're talking about somebody who lived 2,000 years ago. But is it likely, is, it there, is there historical plausibility and likelihood that Jesus of Nazareth existed and was like this? I think absolutely, based upon the, uh, the, the fact that the Gospels don't give the exact same story based upon the fact that this changed people's lives and a movement grows out of it, we know that for sure. And what's probably the second most like, likely thing of all of this is that he died by crucifixion. In other words, we know a lot about the kinds of people the Romans crucified. We know why the Romans crucified people. We know what the politics of that time were like from a whole host of other sources. So does it seem likely that somebody who lived the kind of life Jesus lived would eventually provoke the wrong people, right? And would eventually provoke this kind of wrath from Rome? Almost certainly, right? And why would the church want to hold on to that? In the world of the religious marketplace of the first century, being the followers of somebody who was killed by Roman execution is not usually the way your PR experts would tell you to launch the movement, right? There's something deeply offensive about this, deeply distasteful about this. So it seemed quite likely that that was the case. When you get to other little things, right, like what word did Jesus say here or there? Did he really preach the sermon in this spot? There's all sorts of debates about that, but I'm going to kind of keep moving beyond that. I just want to say, here's the plot, and there's a lot of plausibility, I think, to the plot in general. We know about people like John the Baptist from other sources. We know about other healers and other exorcists in the first century, and something about Jesus looks very much, Jesus in the Gospels looks very much at home in what we know about first century life except for the resurrection part. That kind of surprises everybody. Last thing I want to get to about the Gospels is to talk about the relationships that we can see uh, among all four of them. Um, nobody ever like cites the other one. Like Luke never says, well, like what Mark says, and you know, Mark almost had it right. But we do see connections among them. And this is one of the things I think is kind of fun about studying the Gospels. It's also one of the things that might be a little bit frustrating about studying the Gospels. Um, because we often just want to know, like, what's the story, right? So here's Jesus. If you can't see in the back, pay attention. I don't want four different versions of this going around. So, um, which happens, right? Anybody who's ever spoken to a group or left a meeting thinking you had a plan, right? And then, right. <clears throat> So what can we say about these four Gospels? Um, most scholars, the vast majority of biblical scholars, believe that Mark was written first. Mark's the shortest. That's not the only reason why. But, and Mark is the most kind of unadorned of all of the Gospels. If you read Mark, it, it can be kind of exhausting because the pace is so quick, at least in the first 10 chapters. Um, for a variety of reasons that we don't really have time to go into, most scholars think Mark was the first of the four to be written down. 
probably around the year 70, give or take a couple of years. That's a guess. We can put Jesus's death and resurrection around the years 30 to 33, somewhere around there. There's a timeline in the back if you're interested in that more. So the gospels don't come until maybe at least 40 years after this experience. Why did it take so long? Well, the initial impulse of Christians was not, let's write books. <laughs> the initial impulse of Christians was, let's tell people, let's form these new communities of faith, and let's get ready for Jesus to come back, which could be happening any time now. We read stuff that was written by Christians in the 50s, for example, not 1950s, which some of you remember, but the, fifth, the actual 50s, the real 50s. And there's a kind of urgency about things in there where the Apostle Paul, for example, is honestly thinking like, I'm not even sure it matters to get married anymore. If you're enslaved, like, don't worry about it. Jesus is coming back, right? There's a kind of a, kind of an, an urgency on Paul's part not to disrupt certain aspects of everyday life because it's like, we don't have time for that stuff. Something more important is going on. I think Paul would write differently if he were writing today and was like, oh, yeah, it's been a while to have this church around. And we even see that, though, in documents that, that get written around the year 100, more and more, the church is starting to recognize it's going to be around for a while and needs to think about leadership, needs to think about its own longevity. That's for later on throughout this whole year. So Mark's gospel, the gospels get written during this time where the church, I think, is starting to realize, oh, the original followers are dying off. Jesus is not coming back. We need to make sure this story can be passed along. Part of the story gets used in worship, part of the story gets used in instruction, but it doesn't mean nobody thought about Jesus for 40 years. It just means simply that the stories were passed along, probably orally, uh, and were remembered and kind of developed a form of their own. This sounds weird to a lot of us in America because I can't remember a thing without this, uh, right? We're so used to having that. We're so used now to images and video as well. But there are still oral cultures in the world where storytelling is, it functions almost according to rules, right? Where it's like, this is how you tell a good story. The priest is gonna go by the guy injured in the ditch, the Levite's gonna go by the guy injured in the ditch, and you know the third character, the Samaritan, is the hero, right? The rule of three. Uh, it's just good storytelling. We see in the Gospels ways in which certain stories might be grouped together, healing stories, controversy stories. I mean, there's ways in which the Gospels show the influence of an oral storytelling culture. In other words, if Mark had shown up and written stuff that nobody had ever heard before, there's a really good chance this book would just have, would have had no traction, right? So the assumption is Mark is capturing traditions that are already widely in use and being told. After Mark, <clears throat> Matthew's Gospel is written, um, my favoritely named Gospel, and Matthew um, almost certainly uses Mark as a source. How do we know this? In many places, Matthew tells a story exactly like Mark tells the story. Sometimes the wording is exactly the same, but even more so the sequence of stories. Matthew's almost twice as long as Mark, but the sequence of stories is almost the same. You see what I mean? It's not just that Matthew like borrows or might be copying, not necessarily in a dishonest way, right? People built on other people's manuscripts in the ancient world. But Matthew is pulling from Mark, but also keeping that structure really quite the same. Matthew occasionally adds other things. Either Matthew knows that from other sources. Maybe Matthew is also creative literarily and trying to get us, give us a better sense of the kinds of things Jesus taught. We also have Luke's gospel that also appears to be using Mark's gospel as a source. The main difference here, Luke is also about twice as long as Mark, but Luke really changes the ordering quite a bit. Remember I read from Luke chapter 1 earlier, what did he say? That it was important to have a well-constructed narrative or language along the lines of that, right? I think that's Luke confessing, I made some, I, had, I took some freedom with the chronology here because what I'm trying to do is not necessarily give you the biography exactly as it's supposed to be remembered. I'm trying to make the story make sense to you, right? And if you ever come home or, you know, you're on the phone with somebody and they say, what did you do today? Like, how do you answer the story? How do you answer the question, right? Some of you might start, well, I woke up, I ate this, did this, then there was lunch. Some of you might be like, oh, this happened, also this happened. That reminded me that this happened yesterday, right? There's no one way to tell a story if your goal is, I want, to be, I want this person to make sense of what I did today, right? In fact, a purely linear story about what did I do yesterday might bore all of you to death. Um, maybe not. What did I say yesterday? Actually, I was on a retreat with a lot of you yesterday. I just realized that. Wow. I meant Friday. 
sorry. It was a great retreat. Anyway, I'm never getting out of this one, so I'm just going to move on. Matthew and Luke also bear some similarities to each other. Sometimes they tell stories that Mark does not include, which is interesting. Sometimes they tell those stories verbatim, the words are exactly the same, which lets us, I think, lets us, I think it, it raises the possibility that there is some literary sharing going on, right? People are using sources. There might have been other things that were written down. Luke tells us, remember, many have already endeavored to write down narratives. Maybe there are other gospels that have become lost to us. There are other ancient Christian writings that call themselves, or that have been, that kind of fit this gospel category that are not in the Newer Testament. We'll talk about those this summer, I think, <laughs> summer of 2025. Um, and certainly there was other literature uh, about Jesus that might not have been copied, that just had gotten lost to us. So again, these authors are also compilers. Biblical scholars love using names for things that nobody else knows, and so the, they're often referred to as the synoptic gospels. Synoptic, right, you see optic, C, and then sin, right? Synchronicity, synthesis, together. Right? These are books that see Jesus together. In other words, their stories are relatively consistent. You read Matthew, Mark, and Luke together all in one sitting, and they start to blur together in some ways. There certainly are differences, and we'll highlight some of those, but in general, these are books that have a lot of shared material and tell the story of Jesus in a particular way. You're like, what about John? John's really in its own neighborhood. Uh, not that John tells an entirely different story. It still has that same basic plot structure, but John tells a lot of stories about Jesus that we do not find in other gospels. There are some that are in all four. Maybe the most famous of those is the, the feeding of the 5,000. Also, the crucifixion is kind of a big and important one, but those are stories that are in all four of the Gospels. John also has a lot of language and symbolism that is different from the others. Some terminology, some theological terminology, and some symbolism. We'll be looking at John in about four or five weeks from now uh, that's quite different from the others. So John's kind of an outlier, and this is not just modern people who have recognized that. We even have some documents from the third century that kind of deal with the question of why is John so different, right? Um, and we can go into that more in, in weeks ahead. Um, but John seems to represent memories of Jesus coming from just a different stream, right? A different tributary in kind of Christian memory and Christian practice and Christian tradition, which totally makes sense, right? You can imagine how Christians in one part of the empire might be practicing and remembering and preaching and thinking with different priorities than Christians in a different part of the empire, depending upon who they were, cultural differences, stresses, all sorts of things. I wish we knew more, but these are the differences. So if you hear Margaret and, or myself accidentally say synoptic in the next couple of weeks, this is what we mean, we mean Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Luke is probably the most of the outlier among those three. Luke is the most different among the synoptics. So just so you know, these are people who were sharing ideas, sharing stories, sharing material, um, as best we can tell. Some of this comes up in some interesting ways. Uh, the story of Jesus calming the storm shows up in Matthew, Mark, and Luke the Synoptic Gospels, uh, and Jesus says slightly different things each time. You might remember this. There are, uh, he's asleep in the boat. The storm's awful. He's got a boat full of people. A lot of them fish for a living, and so they're panicking. You know it's a bad storm. Jesus wakes up, yells at the water. The storm subsides, and everybody's looking at him terrified. In Mark's Gospel, he said to them, why are you afraid? Have you still no faith? In Matthew's Gospel, Jesus said to them, why are you afraid, you of little faith? And in Luke's gospel, Jesus said to them, where is your faith? So they're not all the same, are they? Slightly different. Um, and just, you know, one passage doesn't prove anything. But in general, it's interesting because Mark's gospel tends to be the gospel that's the most critical of the disciples. In other words, they're just dunderheads. They always are saying the wrong thing. They never understand Jesus. You just, you keep waiting for the story where he just like, parks the boat and just starts walking. And they're like, hey, where are you going, Jesus? You know, and he's just, well, I'm going to get 12 new ones. You know, this is, um, so that's part of Mark. So what's interesting about comparing these gospels is sometimes we can see trends, right? If indeed Matthew has access to Mark, why is Matthew subtly changing the story? Does Matthew have better information or is Matthew like, I'm sure it wasn't that bad. I'm sure these people weren't total idiots. Um, and so why are you afraid you have little faith? Right? The problem isn't a total lack of faith. It's, it's just that it's little. And then in Luke, where is your faith? Right? Perhaps they have faith. It's just 
taking the day off or something like that, right? It's a little bit less severe. And again, one passage doesn't mean anything, but if we started looking at more and more passages in terms of how are the disciples treated in these three Gospels when we see similar stories, we'll see some occasional differences. So what is what you're thinking? And that takes me to this slide, right? If you remember only one thing today, like the entire day. So when tomorrow somebody says, what did you do yesterday? You can say, I learned this one thing that's really important. The Gospels provide information about Jesus and his life, right? Of course they do. They're biographies, not modern biographies, but they're ancient biographies. But also this is that even more so, the Gospels provide information about how Jesus was remembered by different people amid different concerns near the end of the first century. In other words, what did people need to remember? What did they need to know? The Gospels shine a light into different perspectives on Jesus at the time in which they were written. I really wish they came with prefaces that said, you know, this is what I was doing when I was writing this. Here are the things I was worried about, but they don't. They just tell the story. This becomes really important when we look at John's gospel, for example, and we'll ask the question, why is there so much hostility toward certain Jewish leaders? And why does John refer to them all the time as the Jews? This will be really important in Matthew's gospel when we look at it and we say, why is Jesus so utterly furious with these people called the Pharisees? Like, what's going on here? Why is he condemning them like on every other page? And the answer to that, best guess, the, the bleeding hypothesis on that is that these were books that were written down during a time when the church was finding itself in considerable tension with synagogues in its midst. In other words, still a little bit too early to call it Christianity. Well, let's say Christian faith was starting to go this direction while Jewish synagogue life was saying, no, we're really not interested in that and we're going to go this direction. And what eventually boiled over into a lot more hostility in the second century starts to get reflected in these gospels where the stories that are important for these gospel authors to remember seem to be stories where Jesus is particularly critical of some of his opponents. Does that make sense? It's not to say that Jesus wasn't critical of people during his ministry. He seems he almost certainly was. Have you ever been in a religious setting and watched people talk about theology? Everybody's always grinding an ax about something. Um, but the question is like, why is it so severe in places, right? Is this ways in which the church is trying to hold on to certain memories is particularly important? Why are there so many healing stories in the gospels? Why don't they just tell one or two and just say, and Jesus healed a lot, right? Why are there so many? That probably speaks something, uh, speaks to something in the ancient world where healthcare is tremendously important. There is no social safety net. If you're injured and are unable to work, I mean, if you cut your finger, you get an infection, right? I mean, these are serious things in the ancient world. And if you don't have a family or a religious community to care for you, you don't have a whole lot of options, right? So the question that we know of other gods in the Roman and Greek world that were really valued as healers. So the question of, well, what can Jesus do for people? Right? The idea of Jesus as a healer appears to be incredibly important because that matter of health was so important in the ancient world. And it was very much kind of within, there were physicians, but for the most part, you really didn't want to go to them. If you read ancient medical texts, you know why. Um, leeches and bleeding and stuff like that. Um, so there were options there, but even even the Newer Testament makes fun of physicians. It's kind of funny about how people just get worse when they go to them. No offense to doctors in the room. I know you've gotten better in the last 2,000 years. And I have no desire to go back to the first century for a gazillion reasons. Um, but you see what I mean? That the Gospels tell us something about what were people concerned about or worried about or hoping about. And that's part of the reason why they're different. All right. That's a lot of me talking. I want to move to Judaism. Oh, we can do that in 12 minutes or 17 minutes. That's easy. Right. Any big questions? Have I offended anybody? Have I said something totally off base? Is there something? Mustafa. Yep. Oh, we're going to get a microphone to you, and then I'm going to pivot to Judaism in our remaining I'm time. working my way through the throngs. It's a throng. <laughs> Excuse me. Thank you for your patience. Thank you. <laughs> so when you mention the church uh, uh, as Christians, uh, it does mean the Nazarene? the Jewish messianic that believe that Jesus is the Messiah? Yeah, good question. Like when I say the church, I'm pretty much talking about folks who follow Jesus as the Messiah. I'm, I'm, I'm 
I'm refraining from using the word Christian just because that's technically not really a word that's in use in the first century, at least not much. And it's probably a word used to, um, to mock <laughs> people who are Christians. So when I say the church, I probably should say churches. I'm talking about various Christian communities. There is no centralized structure. But this church is, at the time these books are being written, sorry, churches are, at the time these books are being written, still in an uncertain relationship with synagogues. In other words, still in uncertain relationships with Judaism as a whole. Christianity emerges out of Judaism. Neither Jesus, nor Paul, nor anybody else we read about in the Newer Testament understands themselves as creating a new religion. The reason we now have, and the reason in the second century, church and now Christianity starts to be different from Jews and Judaism is largely about, well, it's about a lot of things. Part of it's about politics, but part of it is about frustration for why not everybody is convinced in turning to this Jesus as the Messiah. Some of it as well is concerned about how are all these non-Jews so interested in this, and why are they not being law observant? Why are they not following Torah? Does that make sense? And so it's still, the New Testament comes from a time where there's a lot of sharp elbows. Um, I'll jump to this, right? I put this on the board. It's not on the slideshow. Uh, I heard uh, New Testament scholar uh, Amy Jo Levine, who's also Jewish, uh, use this, uh, refer to this one time to describe what's going on in some of these gospel stories. And um, I'm not a psychologist. I don't know anything about Freud, so don't ask me about him or my mother or anything. But uh, Freud referred to uh, the narcissism of small differences. And what he meant by that is the more that people have in common, like a family or a clan or some businesses or other groups, the more likely they are to fight really hard about minor things, about small differences among them. Um, whether that's true or not, I don't know. I just love the name, narcissism of small differences. It sounds like what goes on in my head most days. But um, that's part of what we see in some of the hostility in the New Testament, right? You're more likely to fight tooth and nail with somebody who's got a lot in common with you, who's close to you, than you might be with a stranger. So, Jock, and I'll I move on. Uh, the, you, you described the Gospels as kind of loosely constructed sometime long after Jesus has gone. Um, how does this give rise to, or maybe you will cover this down the trail, to the sola scriptura of the Reformation and so forth? I mean, we suddenly at the sola scriptura, we, we invest all the truth is coming out of these Gospels, which are kind of, it seems to me, somewhat loosely constructed. Yeah, um, they're not loosely constructed in the sense that there's no thought given into them. They're loosely constructed in the sense that they don't claim to be exact. They don't claim to be, they don't claim to be comprehensive. Um, goodness, this is a huge question. It's a good question. I'll just say this really briefly. So in the ancient world, as best we can tell, most people think that these books are inspired in some way by God. But they also think every Christian writing is inspired by God. They think the church in general is inspired by God. All they mean by that is that God is present. When we get into the Reformation, you start to get a sense of the Bible's inspiration as a lot more kind of something that's actually embedded in the text itself. You see what I mean? As opposed to the community around these texts and the people who read them is led by the Spirit. You start to get more of an understanding that, yes, yeah, something about this book makes these writings extra special compared to others. And that grows after the Reformation until you get like early 20th century where people are now saying every single word comes from the mouth of God, right? And creation happened in six days, not millions of years. And you know what I mean? That's, some of that is already in the water prior to the Reformation, but the Reformation kind of starts to add more authority to Scripture itself. You see what I mean? And part of that is because Luther's, in Luther's imagination, the church is making all the decisions. The church is doing all the theological deliberation. And Luther sees the church holding the Bible as it's kind of in its grasp. And Luther wants to invert that and say, actually, the church stands under the Bible as the word of God. And that starts to get kind of radicalized or intensified into this idea of the Bible as a book that kind of you know has divine powers streaming out of it, right? And don't you dare drop it or those kinds of things that, that you can drop. I mean, I've dropped Bibles. But sorry, Margaret's. Oh, can't wait for my performance review. All right. <laughs> 
Not on purpose. It is just, I drop things. Okay. Um, I wish we had more time on this. We'll keep coming back to Jesus as a Jew. Um, this is so easy to forget in a world where most Christians uh, are dislocated from Judaism in a lot of ways, in a world where the church's relationship to Judaism through most of our history has been somewhere between awful and god-awful. Um, I, I think in recent generations, that's, we're at, at work trying to repair some of that. Uh, it's easy to forget that Jesus is fully enmeshed in Jewish life and Jewish society. And the Gospels reflect that, not just in the cute story about Jesus as a, as a 12-year-old um, in, the, in the temple learning from the leaders, but really all throughout. Um, and one of the reasons we sometimes forget Jesus' Jewishness is we kind of have this sense of, uh, yeah, Jesus was human, but he wasn't really, right? In other words, we kind of imagine Jesus as not really being human like you and I are. And so these aspects of who he was don't seem to matter. This gets reflected in so much medieval art that paints baby Jesus as like a middle-aged grumpy man. Um, <laughs> do you know what I mean? It's kind of this. Um, <laughs> there's a lot of middle-aged art. You see, you see Mary holding Jesus, and he looks like, he looks like a, an 18-inch long uh, middle-aged man. So, um, <laughs> And part of that comes from, I think, a discomfort with how human Jesus might have been. You know what I mean? Like we really want him to be born with like a full encyclopedic knowledge or something like that. The idea of Jesus growing and learning and developing, being influenced by his parents, is really offensive to some people, right? It's just kind of hard to get our head around because we want Jesus who's like, you know, shooting healing out of his fingertips at age three or something like that and saving the world. We don't get much about his childhood, do we, right? This is ancient biographies. We learn something about his birth in a couple of the gospels, but in general, the Gospels aren't there to tell us exactly what happened. The Gospels are to tell us what kind of a person he was, the stuff he typically did, the stuff he typically taught. And that, as best we can tell, is deeply influenced by his Jewish setting. If you have it in your head to remember two things today, remember the first one, right? The Gospels tell us a lot about how Jesus was remembered at the end of the first century. If you want to remember something else today, it's this, is that Judaism during the first century was very diverse. In other words, there were many ways to practice one's Jewishness. Right? If somebody comes to you today and says, I just moved into town, I'm looking for a church that's just like my old one, your first question is going to be, tell me a lot about your old one, because we've got a lot of different churches here in Minneapolis, right? Um, a lot. And there's no one way to be Christian. There's one way I wish everybody was Christian, and that's to believe what I believe, but you know, I recognize there are many ways to be Christian and to practice one's Christianity. And the Gospels describe Jesus as a full participant in Jewish life and Jewish identity and Jewish debate. So what, you're asking? Well, it means people ask him a lot of questions. I'm going to go through this slide way too quickly. I'll just throw it up there. I'm not going to read all of these. Margaret preached on Mark 7 a couple of weeks ago, which starts off, why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders? People ask him, you know, should we be paying taxes or not? None of us like the Romans being here. If we pay taxes, are we cuddling up to the Romans, or should we resist that? How should we live on the Sabbath day, right? How should we work? Uh, Matt Thiessen goes into some of these issues on the video that's online, so, I, so I'm going to skip lightly over this. He's consistently asked questions about how should people practice, and sometimes he pushes back and pushes back a little sternly toward people. So let's settle into one passage here. Um, Again, he entered the synagogue, spends a lot of time in synagogues, spent a lot, spends a lot of time going there on the Sabbath day, on Saturdays, the day of rest, and doing things that people don't think he should be doing. And a man was there who had a withered hand. They were watching him to see whether he would cure him on the Sabbath so that they might, come, so that they might accuse him. And he said to the man who had the withered hand, come forward. Then he said to them, is it lawful to do good or to do harm on the Sabbath, to save life or to kill? But they were silent. He looked around at them with anger. He was grieved at their hardness of heart and said to the man, stretch out your hand. He stretched it out and his hand was restored. The Pharisees went out and immediately conspired with the Herodians against him how to destroy him. This is only chapter 3, verse 6, and they already want to destroy him. So like I said, Mark moves quickly. A couple of things to notice here. The they, uh, we know this from the end of chapter 2, are a group of Pharisees. More about them in just a second. They, uh, they're, they're watching. They're already trying to trap him, it sounds like, the way that Mark describes this. 
And Jesus appears to know that. So he calls this man forward and then asks this question, is it lawful to do good or to do harm on the Sabbath to save life or to kill? Nobody's going to answer that question, right? He's kind of set a trap for them. Of course, they're going to say you should do good on the Sabbath. What's he grieved about? He's grieved at their hardness of heart. He's not grieved at them because they're Pharisees. He's not grieved at them because they are deeply concerned about Torah, about the law, and how to follow it. He's grieved because something about their heart has gotten calcified. Right? Some, it's not necessarily a statement that like all concern with law observance is somehow heartlessness or something like that. Right? He's mad because they've gotten to the point where to see this man healed right here, right now, is somehow a loss for them, right? is somehow disappointing for them. In other places, he says essentially, what better day to heal than on the Sabbath? What right? better day to heal than on a day that's set aside for human wholeness and restoration? Um, what better time to show God's goodness? At the end of Mark chapter two, he says something. He says, the son of man is Lord of the Sabbath, but he also says, Sabbath, he says, humankind was not made for the Sabbath, but Sabbath was made for humankind. In other words, we aren't following these laws, he's saying to his fellow Jews, right, for the sake of showing how great the law is. The law is put in place for our well-being. And what's remarkable is we have, other, we have records of other rabbis saying about the same thing. In other words, Jesus gets a lot of his best stuff from his Judaism. A lot of the stuff he says fits really well into the debates of his day. So we just need to know that and we need to be alert for that because um, we're going to continue to see it in the Gospels. And so my question then about this passage is a lot of us are kind of socialized to see Jesus and Pharisees. Pharisees are bad people who just like to see people suffer and there's nothing redeeming about them. We know that's not true from other sources, right? These are, these are people who are trying to figure out ways to live according to the law and are trying to promote Jewish well-being in all sorts of ways. What if the problem here isn't so much that Jesus is this, you know, this whippersnapper who doesn't have the right training or who just wants to like knock down all the traditions? What if the Pharisees actually see Jesus as one of their own? In other words, Jesus looks a lot more like the Pharisees than he does any other people in the Gospels. Why is that? He's deeply concerned with scripture. He's deeply concerned with law observance. He's concerned with Jewish practice. Fulfill something. What does it fulfill? Love of God, love of neighbor, right? He's entering into these debates about how is the law parsed, how is the law lived, and he's arguing for a particular perspective on that. If we had more time, I would go into this a little bit more detail. I'm going to show you now the board over here with this amazing Venn diagram display I've put up on the left side there. That whole box is all of first century Judaism. The little red box, those are the Sadducees. We often hear about the Sadducees as if, you know, this is one of the two options, as if Sadducees and Pharisees are Democrats and Republicans. Not the case, right? Only a tiny, tiny, tiny percentage of the Jewish population were Sadducees. These are priests. These are people who work uh, in the temple. These are wealthy families in and around Jerusalem. Pharisees, there's a variety of different kinds of Pharisees, and they're spread out wherever Jews are spread out in the first century, pretty much anywhere in the Roman Empire. And these are groups that are mostly lay people. They're not priests, for example. And they're trying to figure out how is the law lived well. Each of those groups have attached another little bubble uh, for scribes. Scribes are the, these are the nerds. These are the seminary professors. These are people who have got some kind of legal training and, are, and engage in tradition. And they like nothing better but to sit around all day and talk about minutia, which is, which is what I do for a living. Most people are neither scribe, nor, neither scribe, Pharisee, or Sadducee. See what I mean? It's important to get a sense for that. Jesus appears to have had some Pharisaic training, but for the most part, people watching this are seeing, look, look, at, these, look at these people who are really into Scripture fight with each other. <laughs> um, and that's just interesting and worth knowing about. There's also the elders. They're stuck on the Sadducees as well. Some of them are Sadducees, some are not. These are very different from the elders here at Westminster who are all upstanding people. These are the ones who get him killed at the end um, of the story. More on that. Sorry to be rushing here, but I want to...